Hello and welcome everyone to Scientists in Action, Buy Gun Bugs and Prehistoric Flowers. I'm your host Kate from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, where as you may have guessed it, we're not filming today because instead we are here live at the field. We're in Corral Bluffs, Colorado. We are at one of the places where our paleontologists and paleobot paleobotanists um, come and find fossils. Before we get today's program started, a couple housekeeping items I want to take care of is first and foremost, if you're going to be our on-camera schools, I'm going to ask that you stay muted and have your cameras turned off until we're ready for you um, in our Q&A in about 15 or so minutes. If you do not have um, camera access, that is totally fine. We have an open chat, so you can be adding those questions to the chat throughout the program, and I'll make sure our scientist gets them. On that note, I want to introduce you to Dr. Gussie McCracken. Um, she works with me at the museum. I cannot wait to hear more about the fossils that they find here in this space. Gussie, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and why we're here at Corral Bluffs today. This is pretty neat. Yeah. Hi. What does that mean? I'm not getting any sound on Gussie. Gussie might be muted. <laughs> oh, that's why. Oh my God. That's okay. We got unplugged. Can you hear me now? Sorry, y'all. And now you get to see something amazing. And it's also Kim, who usually runs the camera and is never on camera. So, hi, Kim. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. All right, Gussie, now we can hear you. We're good. Okay. Sorry about that, everybody. So I'm Dr. Gussie McCracken. I am a curator of paleobotany at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. So that means that I am in charge of fossil specimens at the museum, about 100,000 of them. And they range from leaves to flowers, seeds, fruit, even some wood and pollen. And not just uh, the fossils at the museum, but part of my job is going into the field and digging up fossil um, specimens, like right here in Corral Bluffs. Very cool. So if you were listening to what Gussie was just saying, you probably got the answer to this question, but we have a poll for you, and we want you to go ahead and place your best guess. What does a paleobotanist study? Um, is it ancient plants? ancient animals, rocks and minerals, what kinds of things maybe ancient animals or insects ate, or kind of all the above. So go ahead and in Zoom or in the chat, I want you to vote as a class and think about what a paleobotanist studies. All right, take a second more to vote if you've not done so already. And let's go ahead and close that poll. Let's see, what have our audiences voted? Maybe the poll is stuck open. <laughs> oh, hey, Riley in studio, did we get that poll launched? I can't actually see it. Well, that is okay. We will just carry on. Um, so, so how I did our, see Oh, there we go. I just couldn't see it. It looks like... Yeah, so it looks like most of our friends have voted all the above. One did say studies plants, but is there a correct answer? What do paleobotanists study? You're all correct. So technically, paleobotany is the study of plants. So excellent work. But part of my job is also to use plant fossils and think about the context in which they're found. So we use the geology that those fossils are found in, the rocks around the fossils, to think about what kinds of environments those plants were growing in. And then we also think about how plants interacted with their ecosystems. So we think about the climate of the time and also things like um, what animals were eating these plants, what dinosaurs might have been eating the plants, what early mammals might have been eating the plants. And what I've also studied quite a bit is um, thinking about how insects were eating fossil plants. So well done, everybody. Um, Y'all got it right. Very cool. Okay, we have a couple more poll questions for you. 
And they are relating to kind of those ecosystems that Gussie was just talking about. So our first question is dealing with kind of what time scale this is that we're, we're talking about today. So during the KT or the KPG extinction, non-avian dinosaurs went extinct. This is at the end of which geologic period? So is it at the end of the Cambrian, Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, or Pleistocene area that we're probably thinking about today when we're talking about these fossils. So go ahead and place your vote for this poll. What end of the geologic period are we thinking of today? All right, let's go ahead and close that poll and see how our audience voted. Ooh, okay, we've got a couple different answers. Um, it kind of looks like an even spread for the most part between Jurassic, Cretaceous, and Pleistocene. Um, what's the correct answer? When did this mass extinction event happen? Well, the mass extinction event is uh, basically the boundary between the end of the Cretaceous and the beginning of the Paleocene. So if you answered Cretaceous, you were correct. Um, what's very exciting about where we're standing today is that Corral Bluffs actually covers the end of the age of dinosaurs, so the last of the Cretaceous period, into the beginning of the age of mammals, so that first million years into the Paleocene. And if you look at this image right here, you can actually see what, what it kind of looks like when you're a paleontologist looking at the rocks. So in your head, you're imagining below the KPG boundary, below the moment in time where the, the dinosaurs went extinct in the rock, you're kind of envisioning finding all these different kinds of dinosaurs. And then above the KPG boundary, you don't find any more dinosaurs. Wild. The ghost dinosaurs. The ghost dinosaurs, exactly. <laughs> um, so speaking of ghost dinosaurs, uh, when this mass extinction event happened, it killed a lot of species, living things on Earth. And we want you to guess for our final poll question, what percentage of life on Earth was wiped out with this extinction event? Was it 25%, 50%, 75%, or 99.99? These are some big numbers, but one of them is correct. So go ahead and make your best guess. All right, let's go ahead and close that poll and see how our friends have voted. Ooh, okay, it looks like the majority said 75%, but we did get a vote for the 99.99. How much of life on Earth was wiped out when this mass extinction event happened, Gussie? Well, y'all are impressive because the answer was 75%. So we think that 75% of all species on Earth went extinct um, because of the asteroid that hit the Earth. So. I want you guys to just imagine this occurring. We have an asteroid that is six miles wide, careening towards the Earth. It smashes into the Earth just outside of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, in the Gulf of Mexico. And as the asteroid hits the Earth, the impact is so big, it's like millions of nuclear bombs detonating simultaneously. And this melts part of the asteroid, it melts part of the earth that it crashed into, and it actually shoots that melted earth back up into the atmosphere. And that melted earth starts raining down around the globe, and it rains down as little glass beads we call spherules. Now, the asteroid also had this element um, called iridium, and iridium is very rare on earth. We actually call it a rare earth element, See, scientists are, are very imaginative. So this rare earth element is actually found at 66 million years ago in the rock record at this moment because the asteroid was partially melted and then redistributed down at this moment in time. So when scientists are running around trying to find the boundary, this KPG boundary that marks the extinction of the dinosaurs, we're looking for that iridium what we call iridium anomaly, and also looking for spherules. 
And again, looking for the dinosaurs below your feet and no more dinosaurs above your feet. And that's how you find the KPG boundary in the rock around the earth. And we actually have the KPG boundary in the rock behind us. So what are some of the things that we see in relation to this KPG boundary in Corral Bluffs? Like why is Corral Bluffs itself so important? Corral Bluffs is so important because we end up with rock that is Cretaceous in age. We have that boundary, that moment in time at 66 million years ago. And then we have the first million years after the extinction event. And what this helps us understand is how the earth recovers from mass extinction. And so here you can actually see the time periods and where we're standing is that line right between the green Cretaceous and the kind of orange Paleocene. It's that moment in time. And so we're interested in knowing how forests come back to life, what kind of new animals and plants are evolving what kinds of things even survived the mass extinction to begin with and how the earth kind of recovers and rebuilds and restructures from 75% of all life going extinct. And that's what we see here. And that's what's preserved right under our feet because we are standing at the top of the bluffs and looking down onto about 2 million years of some of the most fascinating geologic history on earth. That is really cool. Okay. So do you want to walk us maybe through the timeline of what are some of the plants or animals we see after the like ultimate destruction in this area? Yes, absolutely. So the first thing we see is that, well, life is kind of eviscerated on the surface of Earth right after the asteroid impact. And um, what comes back first are ferns. And so we call this the fern spike. And it basically was a period in time between about 85 years to a few thousand years after the asteroid impact, where some of the only plants you're gonna see are ferns and they cover and they blanket the earth. And ferns are actually quite fast growing and they reproduce by spores. So instead of something that reproduces with flowers and seeds, these reproduce by little tiny microscopic pores. And so they can kind of cover the earth and come back very quickly. So the first things that we see are ferns. And then essentially other groups of plants start coming back in greater and greater proportions. So the next group of plants that we see in high abundance um, and that we see quite a lot of here at Corral Bluffs are the palms. And this is what we call palm world. And it happens from about a few thousand years after the asteroid impact to about 300,000 years after the impact. And these are forests that are not very diverse and they are um, very, very, very uh, heavy in palm fossils. And so when I'm digging at this time slice here in Corral Bluffs, we find lots of palm fronds. We find sometimes the flowers of palm trees, the um, trunks of palm trees, and then lots and lots and lots of palm pollen. And so all of these lines of evidence tell us that palms were extremely abundant in these ancient ecosystems. So the next kind of jump in diversity that we find after the extinction event is um, what we lovingly call pecan pie world. And this is sort of a joke because pecans are in the walnut family. And about 300,000 years after the extinction event, we see lots of new types of plants starting to become many, like very speciose, many, many types of species. And among these are walnuts. And so um, the pecan pie world just, just kind of pokes fun at the fact that we get lots and lots of walnuts starting to evolve. And for the first time we're seeing them in the fossil record. And the forests are maybe now becoming a little bit more diverse, like what you would imagine forests look like in some places on earth today. And then kind of the final stage in this big recovery of life on Earth after the asteroid impact within that first million years is what we also kind of jokingly call the protein bar world. And we call it this because of one discovery that we made. Um, and it's the oldest fossil beans found anywhere on Earth. 
and they're found right here at Corral Bluffs. And so beans are extremely high in nutrients and things like protein. They're really wonderful to eat. I'm sure many of you eat beans um, for lunch and dinner all the time, maybe even breakfast, you know, hummus, black beans, refried beans, whatever you're eating. Um, so they're, they're very diverse today. They're the third most diverse type of plant on earth today. And, you know, humans are, are quite closely um, uh, interacting with beans. And so we find the oldest representative of this group of plants here in Crab Bluff 65 million years ago. And one of the coolest stories, I think, from the fossil record here at Crab Bluffs is that when the beans are in uh, Colorado, they're here from about 500 to 700,000 years after the KPG boundary, after the extinction event. And they're here during a time period when the earth was warmer. So they're, the earth kind of warmed up for about 200,000 years. The beans, which evolved probably in Central or South America, were able to migrate up, expand their range north into Colorado. And then when the earth cooled down again, their range contracted and they moved probably south. So what that means is if you're standing in one place, like here in Crab Bluffs, and you're digging in the rock, you find, you find no beans, no beans, no beans, and then 500,000 years you find fossil beans, 700,000 years you stop finding them. So it's a story about the climate changing and the flora changing. And following these beans and this flora are also some mammal herbivores. And so if we can go back to that picture of the protein bar world, um, there is a mammal called Tinea labus. It's in the uh, kind of back left-hand side of that image. And Tinea labus was uh, kind of an otter-like um, early mammal. And um, it was one of the first specialized herbivores. And what does that mean? It means it's one of the first mammals that only eats plants. And we think that it's eating these beans and some of these other newly evolved plants here at Crab Bluffs. And so we get a picture of the beans moving because of climate and these early mammals following their food source. So you can tell a lot from the fossil record. Um, and we, we hypothesize a lot from the fossil record just based on what we find and when. Very cool. So it sounds like when you are kind of creating the picture or the story of like what this recovery of Earth would have looked like, um, it involves not just obviously looking at animals or geology, but plants and all these things and how they interact together. Um, kind of like ecology today, but from a long time ago. So that's pretty neat. Exactly. Um, so I have a question before we invite our on-camera schools to join us, and it is how do we study some of these things? What are some of the tools that we maybe use in the field um, to make these discoveries? That is a great question. So the first thing that I use as a paleobotanist is my handy pickaxe. So if I am looking for fossil leaves, it's very different than if you're hunting for fossil remains of things with bones, like dinosaurs or these early mammals. So if you're looking for bones, you are looking at the hillside and you're looking for bones to start eroding out of that hillside. But with fossil leaves, they're so thin and they're so delicate that erosion destroys the fossil. So I have to look for preserved environments that might have leaves. So leaves often preserve in ponds or river channels, places with water. And those types of environments leave a signature in the rock. And so I'm looking at the rock and I'm reading it like a book, trying to find those environments. And when I find one, then I use my pickaxe and I dig into the hillside. And if I start to see fossil leaves coming out, then I switch over to a much smaller tool. I use this cool little hammer and then I start pulling out blocks of rock. And inside those blocks of rock, might be fossil leaves. And if there are fossil leaves, they tend to cause a weakness in the rock. So what I'll do is I'll pull out a block, kind of like this. Here's how it'd be oriented in the ground. 
And then what I do is I will look for the seams in the fossil rock or in the rock and start tapping them with my hammer, pulling it apart. And lo and behold, we actually find fossil leaves. So here are some fossil leaves. It kind of looks like um, a forest floor and they're not always in perfect condition. So all of these kind of orange areas that you see are fossil leaves. And what's exciting about this is, well, I just broke this open for you on camera and these leaves have not seen the light of day in 65 million years. And you're the first humans to ever see these leaves, ever. So my job in, involves a lot of fun, a lot of adventure, and a lot of exploration. Wow, that is so cool. So we just, we just uncovered basically a pile of leaves from the time of the dinosaurs, and we are the first people to ever see it. Exactly. That is so cool. I feel very lucky right now. That is really neat. Thank you, Jesse. <laughs> um, well, it's hard to top that, but at this point, um, let's hear some of the student questions because y'all have so many amazing things to ask. We can't wait to hear them. Um, if we could go ahead and invite Macintosh Academy to unmute yourselves, we can bring you on camera and we cannot wait to hear your questions. Hi. All righty, you guys wanna say hi? Hi. Hi. <laughs> All righty, John. Cool. What questions do you have for Gussie? Yep, go ahead, John Luke. Nice um, and loud. Um, if you find, you're saying that you're the first mm -hmm. human to ever find these leaves. If you find like a new type of leaf, can you like name it? Ooh, can you name a new leaf you find? That's an amazing question. Um, yes. If that leaf that we just found has never been described by another scientist, you can definitely name it. We have to use either Latin or Greek to come up with the name, but um, what it, was it Macintosh? Yeah. So maybe I'd name a leaf uh, Macintosh and Sonia, something like that in honor of you. So um, yeah, you can you can name uh, the, the new species that you find, um, kind of whatever you want. And so part of my job is really cool because at Crowd Bluffs, we have about 330 types of plants, um, species of plants that we've found. And many of them, maybe a third of them, or sorry, uh, two thirds of them are totally unknown to science. So part of my job is really naming these plants and also trying to figure out what type of plant they might be um, just by looking at the leaves or the flowers or the fruit. That was a cool question. I now also want to name things like that. That is pretty cool. So, and I would say if you, in any of classrooms, if you want to add maybe potential names to the chat that you would name the fossil we just found, if it was something unique, I would love to share those with Gussie later. Um, but what a cool question. Let's go ahead and get another question from Macintosh. All right, Addison. Um, do you, have, you, have you ever found like other parts of the uh, leaves? Have you ever found like bark or anything like that? Oh, wonderful question. Have I ever felt other uh, other parts of these plants other than the leaves? Yeah. So sometimes we have multiple what we call plant organs from the same species. Um, we can find the bark, we can find the wood, we can find flowers, sometimes fruit um, in addition to the leaves. So that, that bean plant that I was talking about, we have the pods like the little kind of edamame looking like um, fruits. And then we also have uh, leaflets that we think go to the same plant species. So that's an amazing question. Here, we actually have a stick we found yesterday. No oh. one was impressed by the stick as I was um, <laughs> because apparently they're really common to find. But you can kind of see right here, we found this yesterday in the hillside. Um, if you've ever broken open a stick and there's kind of like that lighter or darker color, exterior and interior it looks a lot like sticks we have today and this just literally came out of the hill yesterday so yeah cool that was a great question and I got to show off the little stick we found see it is still cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, what's another question from the classroom all right oh this is really hard uh, I've taken both fourth graders and we go to a third grader Colton 
Um, how many like types of different plants have you found? Ooh, how many different types of plants have you found? How many different types of plants have I found? Well, at Crow Bluffs, we have about 330 types of plants. But in my whole career, ooh, that would be that would be thousands because I've worked from the Pleistocene, so the more recent ice ages, a hundred thousand years ago, all the way back into what we call the Permian which is about 275 or so million years old. Um, so I have found thousands of types of plants through many millions of years in time. And that's what kind of makes my job so exciting is because sometimes I can be, um, you know, working right here in Colorado. Sometimes I can be digging plants that are 30 million years old alongside the Panama Canal. Um, sometimes I can be writing a grant to try to go dig plants in the Gobi Desert during the mid Cretaceous about 80 million years ago to 100 million. So my job is really exciting because I get to see all this plant evolution through time and across the globe. That was a great question. I mean, think about how many plants exist today. Um, each of those plants made a fossil, that would be a ton of plants to see. But also there are millions and millions of years before plants today. So plants that don't exist anymore. So that just goes to show how many fossils exist that haven't even been discovered yet. So I'm That's sure a lot of right. you could find them in the future as well. What's another question from the classroom? Oh, I'm going with another third grader. Keep it even, Cal. I have two. Okay, pick one. This one. Have you ever found like a whole plant? Whole plant. Found a whole plant. Um, yes, I have. So in um in Utah, in the Grand Staircase, there are rocks that are about 76 million years old. And within those rocks, I found a cycad. So it sort of looks like a palm tree, but they're much, much, much um older of a plant lineage. And this cycad had the root bulb, so we kind of know what it looked like underground. And then it also preserved some of its foliage or its leaves. And so I was able to see basically what the plant looked like in uh, real life. And it was it was in the side of kind of a, a, um, a river channel today. And so you could actually in the rock see this plant and it was still standing kind of um, upright as a fossil. And so we think that there was a big flood that came down and buried this cycad um, in living position, what we call in situ um, in the field of paleontology. And so that was kind of cool that we saw one whole plant instead of, say, a leaf that had washed down downstream or, or uh, traces of the roots or, you know, just the trunk of a plant. Um, we actually got to see all of it. That's a wonderful question. Thank Very you. Very cool. I would love to see that too. That's so sweet. Um, okay. In the interest of time, let's get one last question from Macintosh. Um, and I saw there were so many hands. Uh, if you have more questions, which I'm sure you do, you can always add them to the chat. And if we have time at the end, we can give Bessie some more that way. But let's get one last question from Macintosh All before right. we invite our other camera schools to Six join us. Six of eight are out. We have a lot of questions. Uh, yeah. Okay. Holden, you get the final question. Um, what was the latest and the oldest, your first plant you found? Oh, the latest and oldest plant you found. Okay, so the oldest plant I've ever found was a, um, a fern that grew about 300 million years ago. Um, it's unnamed, so we don't have a name for it. Uh, other scientists might be in the process of naming it, but it's housed at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. And then the youngest plant I've ever found, this is a really cool one. So um, uh, when I was up in Snowmass, Colorado, which is outside of Aspen, um, we were digging this 60,000 to about 100,000 year old site um, way up in the mountains. And we would um, dig through what what were peat bogs at the time, and you could see some of the the 
um, plant material in those peat bogs and you'd uncover it and it'd be like a little bit green still. And then it would hit the air and it would oxidize, basically decompose a little bit and it would turn brown to black. And so that was pretty cool to see um, just for a split second what those plants would have looked like um, when they were growing, you know, a few thousand years ago. Wow, that is wild. What a cool question that was. Um, yeah, so like I said, go ahead and you can add some of those other questions you might have to the chat, or you can always write letters to Gussie. We love receiving letters at the museum um, because I love your questions. Those are amazing. So at this time, let's go ahead and invite Purdue Elementary. If you want to go ahead and bring yourself on camera and unmute, we can't wait to hear your questions this morning as well. So, hi, so, Bear. What questions do you have? What was the first fossil you've ever no? What was the rarest fossil you've ever found? Ooh, rarest fossil you've ever found. Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, I find a lot of rare fossils actually, because in paleobotany, sometimes you just find one single leaf of a species and that's the only one that's ever been found in all of existence. So my job actually is about finding many, many, many rare fossils. Um, but I would say another rare fossil would be the bean plants from Corral Bluffs because they are the earliest ones ever found and we only have a few of them in our collections. And so they're very, very precious to us. Um, and we use all of the specimens we find to then uh, come up with a new name for them and describe them, which is in the process right now. Very cool. Yesterday, we were hearing from a couple other people who work at the museum, and they were talking similarly about, we've only found one tooth from this lizard or one tiny piece of this sort of rodent animal. And so there's a lot of fossils that it sounds like there's just one of, um, which means there's a lot of opportunity to find more of those species or just new species in the future. So cool question about rarest, rarest fossils. Um, what is another question from April Coleman's crew? So what, like, have you ever found a bunch of like dinosaur fossils in one area? Have like, we found a bunch of dino fossils in one area? Skeletons. Ooh, entire skeletons. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I do some work up in North Dakota, and we find um, whole skeletons of dinosaurs up there. Sometimes they're all mixed together. Um, and so sometimes you're pulling out different bones and you're trying to figure out what type of dinosaur it is. Is it a triceratops? Is it some sort of duckbill dinosaur? Um, probably uh, it's not a super complete dinosaur, but there's this one specimen that I found once uh, when I was an intern at the Denver Museum. And this was a duckbill dinosaur from Utah. And it had its skull preserved, so its head preserved, and then part of its backbone. And what was really cool about this fossil was that it had some of the skin impressions preserved around the neck. So you could actually see what the skin of this duckbill dinosaur would have looked like when it was alive. And I thought that was just the coolest thing. And we dug it up and we packaged it up and then it was so heavy that we had to have a helicopter come and lift it out of the field for us. Um, and so that was, you know, maybe not the most complete dinosaur fossil ever found, but I found it myself and I was proud of it. And I think it's very, very cool. So it's one of my, my favorite memories as a paleontologist. Very cool. Oh, that would be such a neat thing to find. What's another question from the classroom? what is the first fossil you ever found what is the first fossil you ever found well the first fossil i ever found um was when i was in the second grade i'm originally from ohio and our school had a limestone gravel parking lot and so i would go out there and um with the supervision of my teacher i would uh, look for little shells and so um, marine shells of, I don't even know what age they were, but marine shells were the first fossils that I ever found. 
What a cool memory. I wonder if that teacher knows that you, does your teacher know that you're a paleo, like paleobotanist now and that you do this for a living? They do. Yeah, she does. And she's very proud. <laughs> ah, that's really cool. So maybe some of you have also found your first fossils today or even earlier. So that's pretty neat. What a cool question. Uh, let's get another question from the classroom. Darcy. Um, how long does it take you to dig out fossils? Like, depending how big or small it is. Oh, that's a great question. Oh, yeah, that is a really important question. So it depends on the type of fossil. Um, I can dig out 300 leaves in a day. I can dig thousands of leaves in a year. Um, so those are relatively quick. If I'm digging up a dinosaur, sometimes a single dinosaur can take one or two field seasons. We can work on them for multiple years. So it just depends on the type of the animal or plant and how big it is and how hard the rock is. Um, if you're looking at pollen, fossil pollen from plants, you can actually just take a little chunk of rock and in that little chunk of rock are gonna be millions of, of pollen um, and fern spores. And so it's just a question about scale and what you want to study, um, but it can take a second to years. Wow, you have to be very patient for science. Uh, a quick plug from February, we did we did do a, another broadcast from our paleo prep lab in which we have another team of people who are helping kind of pick the fossils out of some of these big rocks. So this process that Gussie's talking about doesn't just stop in the field, it continues for even years to come, which is pretty cool. Let's get one last class question from the classroom before we invite our last group on camera. Um, what is the largest, oh, sorry, what is the largest fossil you ever found? Largest fossil you've ever found? Oh, the largest fossil <laughs> I ever found was a um, fossil tree trunk of a uh, conifer, so a type of evergreen um, that was probably about, trying to think of how to put it maybe like five car lengths long. So it was a very tall tree that was fossilized and it was about 70 million years old. Um, so that's probably the biggest one I ever found. Um, but some of the dinosaurs we dig up are pretty big too. That's a big fossil, a lot, probably a lot larger than the ones you were finding in second grade, but that's pretty cool. Definitely. What a great question. Okay, let's get our last group to go ahead and join us on camera. We could have Tiffany O'Dell's crew from Byers Middle School High School. We would love to hear your questions. Uh, your camera's like oh, facing up. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's facing up. Pretty cool. Hi there, we can see you. <laughs> oh. Uh, uh, how did you know you wanted to be a paleontologist? And do you like working with uh, plants or animals better? Ooh, cool question. Yeah. Um, you know, I've always loved being outside and I, I've loved biology and ecology my whole life, but I didn't know I wanted to be a paleontologist until I was in college. Um, after going into the field with my mentor, um, and getting my hands dirty and digging up fossil leaves. So that's kind of when I knew that I could do this as a real job um, and that I could do this for the rest of my life and never get bored. And the second part of the question, uh, remind me what that was. Oh, do I like plants or animals better? Um, that's tough, that's really tough. Um, I love plants. I always wanna dig up fossil plants first. But the reason I love fossil plants is that they help us build an ecosystem from the ground up. And so it's really like getting a forest in your mind's eye from all of the fossils that I dig, where we can start to put animals back into that space and really think about how the ecosystem functioned as a whole. So I'll say plants with the caveat that I love vertebrates and I love insects in particular. Very cool. 
That was an awesome question. Um, what's another question from buyers? Um, what are the steps to becoming a paleologist? Paleobotanist. Ooh. Yeah. What does it take to become a paleobotanist? Yeah. So, um, you know, you can be a paleontologist in many ways. There are many jobs that you can have where you work with fossils. But for me as a curator, I went to college and I got a bachelor's and then I got some experience working in museums um, and went back to graduate school to get a PhD. So I'm a doctor, but not the like medical kind. That's very useful. I'm just a doctor of dead things. And, um, you know, I think what it really takes to be good in this field and to make it in the field is um, just a lot of curiosity, wanting to know what's in that rock, wanting to know how things evolved and always being super curious. And so um, I think there's just a lot of determination and a lot of curiosity combined with, at least for being a curator at a museum, um, spending lots of time in school. Great question. Very cool. I love that curiosity is such a big part of it because I think a lot of us are curious in all types of science. So that's pretty neat. Sure. What's another question from buyers? Uh, my question is, why do you have to name undiscovered leaves with Greek or Latin words? Oh, yeah. Why do we name them with Greek or Latin? It's That's a great question. So it all stems back to a scientist named Linnaeus. And um, basically, it's just a way to keep things um, like uh, similar um, so that we're not going off in wild directions and naming things with, you know, 20 words long, you know, just keeping it Greek or Latin, keeping it as a species, and a genus and a species and using the um, construct of, you know, kingdom, phylum, order, class, family, genus, species. It's just a way for humans to keep track of things um, because this might be getting a little bit into the weeds, but, um, you know, we see species on earth today and we know that, uh, you know, this type of grass is different than that type of chipmunk and so forth. But, um, you know, at some level, naming things is just for us humans to keep track of it in our minds and make sense of the world. Um, and so having rules about it just like it needs to be Latin or Greek, it needs to be a, a kind of a classics study um, way to characterize things. It's just a way for humans to, to keep track of this enormous biodiversity that we see today and we see through time. Very cool. That was a great question. Um, and relating to what I actually saw in the chat, have you ever had anything named after you? Uh, no. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Um, I was really hopeful. One of my colleagues was describing a, a fossil lizard that I found. And this lizard was like, I don't know, at least this long. Um, it was this big 75 million year old lizard. And I was hoping to get a name, um, get it named after me, but they named it after someone else in the field. So like, ah, shucks. But I guess I'm just going to have to keep mentoring students and and keep working in the field and and maybe maybe I don't deserve a fossil name. Maybe someone else uh, deserves a fossil name or we can name fossils after just the characteristics of the fossil itself, which might be the best way to do it. That's true. Cool. Well, I either way, I hope you get a fossil named after you. So um, if you hear this, everyone who's watching and you find something, you could name it after Gussie and that would make her day. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a lizard. It could be anything. Um, Okay, let's get one last question from the classroom before we say goodbye. Um, what is your favorite, where is the KT boundary in Colorado? Oh, where is the KT or KPG boundary in Colorado? Oh, that is a fantastic question. So um, in the Denver area, basically spanning from present day Fort Collins through Denver down into Colorado Springs, uh, we we are in what's called the Denver Basin, and it's sort of like a bowl of rocks. And um, this bowl of rocks has eroded away. And so we've actually been able to plot the Cretaceous-Paleogene boundary kind of all around 
um, the Denver area, extending from Colorado Springs up into Fort Collins. And so geologists have mapped where the boundary should be in relation to where we are. And then you basically go and walk that little line that they've predicted. And if there's rock outcropping, then we look at the chemistry of the rock. And so the KPG is actually all around us here in Colorado. Um, we have a beautiful section out near Strasburg in Eastern Colorado. We have a great section here. And then the KPG boundary outcrops all over the earth in marine and land-based um, ecosystems. So it's kind of, you know, it's rare, it's hard to find, but we do find it all over the place um, even still. Great question. That was an awesome question. Um, so is there anything else you wanna leave our students with today? We're kind of out of time, which is so sad because I love these questions, but um, what do you wanna tell them about being a scientist or just anything? Yeah, um, well, I just, I was blown away by your questions because I think that you're all scientists. We all do science every day. We make observations and we ask questions about them. And so whether or not you wanna be a scientist professionally, I would just say, keep being curious, keep being a scientist in your everyday lives and um, keep noticing everything that's around you in nature. Awesome. Seriously, thank you for those questions. They were so cool. And there were just so many more in the chat. Um, I'm for sure gonna be sharing those with Gussie later because I want her to know about them as well. Um, Thank you for joining us, everyone who was on camera or just posted questions in the chat. We couldn't have done it without your curiosity. Um, thank you, Riley. Thank you, Asa. Thank you, Kim, who y'all can't see, but they're behind the camera and in the studio making sure today's program happens. Thank you, of course, Gussie. Um, your knowledge was just so interesting and we got to see so many cool things like a brand new fossil never seen by humans before. So this has been such a treat. Um, I hope you will come back for a future broadcast. We are actually going to be taking a break for summer, like a lot of you probably are as well. Um, but join us in September. We have some really cool projects coming up next school year, and we cannot wait to share more science with you. So this has been so fun. We hope to see you again and have an amazing day. Bye. 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 Bye.